Hello, everyone. It's Doug Woodward. It is yet another hot seat program. This time, the question is, who's in the hot seat? And it's really not my guest. She's been in the hot seat a lot, as you're going to learn. But the hot seat really is going to be uh, the, the minions of Satan. It's going to be the, the powers of the evil one. And it's going to be uh, those that have used a lot of these, the wiles of the devil, if you will, uh, even in governments around the world, in particular, our government. And so we're going to get into all these things. Um, I, so let me introduce you to Kay Tolman. And uh, Kay is, uh, is just a delightful person that I have had the pleasure of, of getting to know over the past, oh, I'd say four years. Uh, Kay has been in the ministry really for 17 years. Uh, after she went through for so many years, uh, all of these challenges, she survived them and uh, has, has experienced some just incredible things that I think you're going to find shocking, stunning, astounding. But based upon my experience over the last 10 years, 12 years of research and writing, uh, discussions I've had with probably a dozen or more counselors of which I probably stay in touch with six or seven right now. Um, you know, it's my testimony that what we're going to talk about today is true. That doesn't mean we're Kay and I are going to agree on everything because I've got some theories about why things happen. I'm more of a researcher, author. She's more of a, has become a clinician. That doesn't mean that she doesn't write. She does. It doesn't mean that she doesn't have great thoughts and great, great uh, research. She does. But, uh, but we need to come at it from a little bit of a different angle. And so I think that her practical experience will will really be just a tremendous blessing to those of you that listen in. But I do warn you, we're going to get into some really amazing things, and some of you are going to shake your head, but my testimony is that it's true, so I want you to know that. So uh, uh, Kay's written a couple of books, uh, Satanic Ritual Abuse Exposed, Recovery of a Survivor, that's her testimony, and then Moved with Compassion, A New Wineskin, which really deals with a lot of the lessons that she's learned and applies in her ministry. And uh, so at the end of the program, I'll tell you ways that you can get hold of her. And uh, I should say up front, though, that Kay is training right now. She's not taking new patients or new folks that need counseling, but she will make available some referrals. And so, well, I shouldn't say referrals. I should say she will make available some resources that you, if you are reaching out for assistance, will need to do kind of your own due diligence. But we'll give some guidance as to how you can, uh, you can do that. Hello, Kay Tolman. How are you? Are you there? Excited to be here. Great. There you are. Okay, great. Um, well, you know, I guess what we wanted to do first off is really get into just some of the definitions of things like, you know, what is DID? What is trauma-based mind control? What is satanic ritual abuse? And so um, give us just some definitions that you work with and that you've learned to be true through the years. Okay. Well, um, I was thinking it might be wise even to give a definition of what is ritual abuse. Absolutely. Because for some people, um, they're not clear on what that is. Mm -hmm. So this is my definition. Um, and it is that ritual abuse is the most heinous form of abuse known to man. Generally, it involves the sadistic abuse of children within a group setting for the promotion of the group's ideological agenda. It is repeated and often prolonged perpetration of extreme physical, sexual, verbal, emotional, emotional, mental, mm. and spiritual abuse involving occult activities and or satanic or Luciferian ceremonial rituals. Mm. So ritual abuse is really a heinous form of child abuse that affects every facet of who a person is and who they believe they are. So uh, ritual abuse is also more prolific than I think most people realize. So it's an important thing that, that you're willing to expose this and to talk about it. I think we're at a critical juncture in history where it's appropriate to start shining the light on what's yep. been going on the last 70 years, especially. Indeed. And, and, and uh, yeah, in our, in our country and in our experience, uh, as we'll talk, you know, we'll find out that this has been going on for centuries, but um, yes, it has, it has obviously become my goodness, just uh, an infestation. And 
there are you know estimates that suggest I think even you know at least minimum of two percent of the population of, of our country, which means six million people have been directly affected by uh, ritual abuse. Uh, and some of them, as we'll learn, we'll talk a little bit more about kind of how the governments have used this from sort of a military standpoint. But uh, yeah, now how, let's talk a little bit about the connection with, with generational abuse and through the history, you know, why has why has this been there? And, you know, there's kind of a broad subject of satanic, and you know, warfare um, that well, spiritual warfare that we'll get into, but, you know, that's pretty broad and this is very specific. Um, talk a bit about some of the history of this, because this had a very direct effect and causation for what was happening to you. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, if you dig into your Old Testament, you'll find that ritual abuse is actually described in the Old Testament in the places where uh, people put their children through the fire to Molech. Um, so, so we know that it's, it's um, an ancient form of evil that has been going on for millennia. Um, but I would say that, um, well, I'll speak for, for my context, Mm -hmm. um, my ancestral lines go back um, well into the history of um, uh, Western Europe. I come from a multi-generational uh, Illuminati bloodline. And so uh, what does that mean? So in ancient cultures, uh, even Western ancient Europe, People practiced occult rituals for power, which is no different today than what they're, they were doing back then, only they were very hidden about it. They were very discreet. Even tarot cards were created to propagate um, occultism and occult belief systems in a way that wouldn't bring the persecution of the Catholic Church or um, a charge of heresy. So, uh, but occultism has been has been going on uh, for for centuries, and certainly in my bloodlines. So, um, I'd say probably the most significant part of my bloodlines go back to Mary, Queen of Scots. So, I'm I have a, a royal Stuart bloodline, which um, also uh, is a Scottish bloodline, which also mixed with the Livingston bloodline. And the Livingstons actually were kind of like royalty in America. Mm. Um, so I have some very famous ancestors uh, from the Livingstons of New York in America. And, and, and uh, like David Livingston, uh, I guess we would consider his a godly bloodline, uh, right? And yet there's, there's a mixture, isn't there? Yes. And, you know, one of the first pastors that worked with me, he said, he really believed that, that the occultists intentionally went after some of the godly bloodlines. Even the name Livingston or Livingstone is biblical, right? Sure. So uh, it comes, the, the name was derived from a godly heritage. And so actually part of, you know, part of my recovery and my healing is calling forth the treasure in the bloodlines from the godly people that were in the bloodlines and to deal with the, how I felt about the shame of all the occultists that were in the bloodlines. Right. But occultists believe that uh, power can be, can roll through the bloodlines like DNA. So blonde hair and blue eyes can be inherited. And they also believe that occult power can be inherited. And so this is one reason uh, um, occultists will intermarry for um, occult power. And you see this also with the royal bloodlines where they would marry for power. And you don't have to look too far today to look at even the British royal family today. And you see all of the major occult organizations that they're involved in. And all of that is for an accumulation, not only of wealth, but of power. And I think that as we start to, okay, so we, we look at those bloodlines and we see that people were trying to accumulate power 
and, um, and to move that power through the generations, they also saw it as a form of eternal life. So kind of like ancestor worship, and they would put their spirit in their progeny. And so that the younger children would then carry the spirits of the ancestors in the bloodline that would give supposedly the child more power, but also essentially a form of the cult eternal life. Mm -hmm. So they had, they had a lot of purpose and long-term planning in what they were thinking and what they were doing. And I will say the Illuminati, they breed for intelligence, like, you know, like wealthy people breed horses um, to be spectacular on the racetrack. Uh, The Illuminati um, breed children for intelligence and for occult power. Let me let me ask one question. This really is the sort of the creation of power, the transference of power. Um, is it related to, you know, this satanic, um, motivation to, to, you know, basically harm humanity? Um, is it, you know, that Satan wants this to occur, he wants to damage humanity and, and his, his promise though, is if, if individuals will do these rituals, that he will imbue them with this power or sort of look out for them. How, how would you explain that? And is that kind of your understanding? Well, I definitely would agree that, um, that Luciferian uh, belief systems are all about power, power and control. And the, when you get down to the nitty gritty, the purpose of it is to drive people away from relationship with the one true God. Mm-hmm. So they do that in a number of different ways, but certainly trauma-based mind control and uh, early childhood trauma creates a system of um, separation where people feel separated from God, from self, from others. And really that's the ministry of recon- reconciliation. And that's what Jesus talked about in Matthew about, um, you know, really the God is, is calling us uh, to put him first, mm-hmm. to love him and to love others as ourselves. So the enemy has intentionally gone against those relationships in such a destructive way as um, to attempt to permanently destroy bloodlines or permanently um, destroy the power of God in churches or the power of God in families. So I, I think it's very intentional. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, I'm a systems guy. I was a Microsoft guy at one time. It's systematic. I mean, it's, it's not, I think that lots of times Christians have this sort of gooey ethereal sense of what evil is, and it sort of doesn't really have um, intelligence behind it. Um, But there is just as God has a plan, Satan has a plan and the things that occur, they're really part of a system that, that he has in effect run the world with. Now I happen to believe as I know you do, that those powers were defeated, absolutely defeated at the cross. And yet it's been God's plan to continue to allow um, satanic influence to prevail until the church stands in the way and blocks it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so let's talk about that. And then kind of the, you know, I guess Fritz Springmeier's generational you know, the 13 families and so forth, that's been made pretty famous for those of us that study this, um, you know, this, this area. Um, Talk a bit about, if you would, the generational thing, the bloodlines, the 13 bloodlines of the Illuminati, and, uh, and kind of this overall system, uh, the plan, you know, that Satan has. Well, I'll speak first to Fritz Springmeier's work on the 13 Illuminati bloodlines. I um, actually purchased his book. I used to live in Portland and uh, he, he wrote. And at one time I lived in, in the Portland area. I don't know if he's still there. Um, but I bought this book and I took it home and I just stuck it on the shelf. And one day the Holy Spirit said to me, pull, pull that out. Mm-hmm. And I thought, 
I thought, well, you know, it's so dark. And, and the Lord was like, no, no, I want you to look in that book. And so my bloodlines were on so many pages. I, I mean, I learned things about my family. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. So I was really, really shocked. But I will say this. There are a lot more than 13 bloodlines. So the you know, when you start intermarrying families with families with families, you can have Illuminati influence in hundreds of bloodlines. Um, there may be some most power, most powerful families, but I would say the most powerful bloodlines actually have people mm. in their bloodline, like the Medici bloodline, where there's four popes in the Medici bloodline. And the Medici bloodline married in with the Habsburg bloodline, which I have Medici in my bloodline, I have Habsburg in my bloodline, mm. a Tudor in my bloodline. So, you know, I start looking at all of that and I think, wow. Um, one of the things that's interesting that maybe Christians haven't thought about that happens with these big royal bloodlines is they will have wars or they will have um, they will, you know, incite a massacre and people think, oh, well, you know, that was a religious war. Like, you know, what the um, Catholic Church did to the Huguenots. But actually, I believe it was very similar to what, not, what Hitler did with the Jews. These were human sacrifices to empower this evil system, this evil antichrist system. And I'm going to say that it's very methodical and we're fools if we think that Satan hasn't been methodically planning for hundreds of years. You can go back to Bacon in the 1500s and his plans for the new world, which is the United States, right? You can go back to that and say, wait a minute, they have been methodically planning this for a really long time. Right. So Atlanta. we can't be ignorant to the wiles of the enemy and the innocent bloodshed we see in abortion today is empowering the Luciferian system in the same way that the Hitler's um, murder of 6 million Jews and the anti-Semitism was empowering an evil structure in that day. So he could use that occult power. Yes, in an attempt to rule the world. And we're still seeing that today. And, and, and absolutely. And that is the that is, again, that's the thing that I think that that as Christians, you know, that we we're so caught up in our own life. And for obvious reasons, we all have challenges, um, but we really shy away from understanding the 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 spiritual warfare that is conducted at this level. And how mm -hmm. uh, individuals uh, are caught up into it, uh, powerful families, you know, some of those bloodlines, you know, the Vanderbilts and the Kennedys and the Bushes aren't probably named, but they're. <laughs> oh, that's an Illuminati bloodline. That's absolutely. Bush is an definitely an Illuminati bloodline. Absolutely. And so, you know, you have all of those pieces of it, but, you know, this is sort of the, the overarching plan. I believe of of the ages, just as you mentioned, going all the way back to um, the Old Testament and to when Moses was beginning to try to clean out a lot of what had been going on already since after the flood, right? right. <laughs> all, right. It didn't right take long in. after the it flood. It did not take long, <laughs> you know, to creep back <laughs> in, and, yeah. uh, and so it's it, it's the it's the overall plan now. Having provided this sort of background, this backdrop, I think what I'd like to move in now to is, is the, a lot of the stuff that I've researched and, and you have as well, and you've been affected again by this personally, which is the governmental use of trauma-based mind control kind of uh there's a lot we can talk about here some of the famous things like you know project monarch bluebird artichoke mk ultra uh and all of this and and um i'm gonna let i i have a lot of this but i'm gonna let you talk a bit about uh your understanding of this and its and its relationship to what is happening and is very practical in our country which is what we have to deal with primarily today if you would mm -hmm. 
Let me talk a little bit about witchcraft through the generations. So, you know, and uh, think back to the stories of King Arthur and Merlin and the witchcraft, right? So, so witchcraft was being used for insight, for quote, power, that kind of thing back. And it never stopped. So what started to happen, especially at World War II with Hitler, is Hitler wanted to harness occult power for political purposes. And that's really where we start to see a real shift in history was at that point. Well, we know that um, Joseph Mengele, I guess it was pronounced Joseph, um, that he was the doctor in charge of Auschwitz and he did human experimentation on thousands and thousands of the prisoners at uh, the prison camp Auschwitz. I believe that he um, carefully detailed his research. Now they call him a doctor, but you know, he was a doctor of eugenics and study of DNA and generational lines, not like a GP you would go to with a cold. This guy had a doctorate in a specific form of medicine related to bloodlines and related to biology and DNA. And really the enemy used this man very instrumentally, not only to research um, how to affect bloodlines and how to induce trauma, how much trauma can we induce before someone dies, um, that kind of thing. But I, I believe that he... I believe that he left Nazi Germany through the Vatican. And I believe that he sold his research back to the CIA after the war. So I have worked- By the way, I, I, I will just say at this point, I absolutely agree. I've written extensively about it and, we'll, and I'll mention that in, in, the, in the notes, but please go on, please continue. Yeah, so, so in the years that I've been working with SRA survivors, and I tell you, I lost, I stopped counting after about 150 that I worked with. A very large percentage of the survivors I worked with either had some exposure to Mangala, especially older people. Now, Mangala died in 1979. Um, I was born in 64, so I had exposure to him on numerous occasions. So I'm in my mid my mid fifties now. So um, you look I find like it forty. <laughs> I know. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> it's part of the spiritual thing, you know that the the glow. It's a it's, it's a, a resurrection life. It is it's a resurrection it is. life in Christ. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, so so I've worked with many many survivors that remember him as Papa. Or, or had exposure to him or to his protégés that may have gone by the same name. But personally, um, in my book, SRA Exposed, I talked about um, some really specific encounters that I had with Mangala. And I remember him saying to me very specifically on a tarmac in South America, uh, I had gotten off a small private jet and I had come down the, the stairs of the aircraft and he met me at the base of the airplane. And he said, I know your father. And he said it in a very thick, very thick German accent. So I had encounters with Mangala and it is my belief that um, certainly along the West Coast, which is where most of the work that I've done with survivors has been, um, he was prolific in not only abusing people, but in um, teaching techniques for mind control programming to Satanists and Luciferians throughout the whole region. So he was very prolific, definitely an antichrist spirit. And I, I think that um, one of the things that's important to know about Mangala is he was diabolical. I mean, really diabolical. And he was looking for ways to affect entire generational lines, to drive people away from the living God. 
And I believe that one of the, the most dangerous things that came out of uh, his research during World War II and the subsequent implementation by the CIA in the, the 1950s, of the mind control programs, is something I call Janus programming. And Janus programming creates a split self where this part might be Christian and this part Luciferian. So the Luciferian self, now they call it Satanism, mm. but most Satanists were actually worship Lucifer. Most of, uh, most of the occultism is Luciferian. And so it's hidden in the back. So they program this back self and then overlay a false Christian self. And so what we have has, in, has infiltrated the American churches. So what I believe has happened is Freemasonry, which is Luciferian, has infiltrated the churches throughout America. And we have a false Christianity with a Luciferian back power system. I call this the Janus system or counterfeit Christianity. And so what has happened in our churches is all the life, all the power, all the miracles ended up leaving the American churches. And yes. for 70 years, we've been powerless and wondering, where's Jesus? <laughs> you know, I thought he had victory on the cross. Where's the miracles? Well, the problem is we're not really connecting with the living God. We're, we are participating in a false Christian system. It's counterfeit Christianity. And this was the diabolical plan the enemy has had, I believe, for a very, very long time. So I believe what God wants to do today with testimonies like mine of people that can come out of generational, multi-generational ritual abuse, come out of an Illuminati bloodline, come out of abuse from Mangala, and come into a true and authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. Because I tell you what, without that, nobody heals. Mm. People can, I do not believe SRA survivors can heal outside of authentic relationship with the true and living Lord Jesus Christ. And everything about the programming, everything about counterfeit Christianity drives people away from God. Mm. That's where the healing is. That's where the healing of our nation is. That's where the healing of our people, our bloodlines, that's where the miracles are. Mm. And so I'm excited as we enter into this new era to see how God not only exposes the workings of the enemy, but that he starts to bring the resurrection life in people that have really yielded their life to him. Amen. But I, I want to also say this, when people have been abused, when they've been um, horribly abused, if I have a moment, I'd like to share a story from in utero. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, okay. That, that may, that may stun people too, but go right ahead. <laughs> okay. So, um, the scripture says that um, God knew us before the foundation of the world, right? So before Psalm the foundation, God knew us, right? Mm -hmm. So one time I said to the Lord, Lord, I need you to take me back because I felt like I had so much shame in my life. I just felt so dirty and icky and awful. And, and I was like, God, could you take me back before all of that. And he took me back to when he created me in the palm of his hand. Mm -hmm. And actually, I believe this is such a powerful exercise for people to go back before, before we were even put in the womb. And God was like, I, I made you and I made you good. You were made in my image, perfect and pristine and beautiful. The minute I hit the womb, all the demonic and the generational bloodlines hit my little spirit. Mm. And I believe I actually split at conception. Mm. People might think, well, how could all that demonic hit you right at conception? 
Well, all those Illuminati bloodlines had dedicated the sperm, the egg, the womb of every family member for generations. It had all been dedicated to Lucifer. So the minute I was conceived, Lucifer said, she's mine. And there was a demonic attack at the moment of conception. So here's what happened in my little heart. Hmm. God, you abandoned me. You left me and the enemy attacked me. And actually I had a bitter root judgment against God. And he didn't protect me in the womb. There were trauma rituals that were conducted while I was in the womb. And by the time I was born, I was already well dissociated. And this is actually the foundation for trauma-based mind control programming. The earlier it starts, the more effective they can build a structure of dissociated identities internally. Mm. And so that's what happened. Well, when we have a judgment against God, we're separated from God. So even though I wanted to know God and I wanted to love God, God, God said to me, he showed me one day, I said, God, I still feel insecure. <laughs> and he, what he said to me was, you judged me. Mm. And that's why you feel separate from me. And I said, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. And I repented. And he said, if you will yield to me and you will trust that I am good, I will unite you with me. And I got a healing that was like a John 17, you are one in me, I am one in you. We are one in the Father that healed insecurity in me that had always been there. That is so, so powerful. That is so powerful. Let, let me, uh, that's wonderful. And I want to get, of course, more. Uh, I'm actually reading a book right now that's a relatively new book by a guy named Stephen Kinzer that's called Poisoner in Chief. And it's dealing with a guy named Sid, Sidney Gottlieb. And uh, a project that we normally associate with MK Ultra, but the reality is that he actually started in Project Bluebird and what then became Project Artichoke. And just a real quick little history here is that coming out of World War II, uh, as we got into just the beginning of 1950, 1951, uh, Beatle Smith brought a guy named um, Alan Dulles. Dallas Airport mm -hmm. after, yeah, <laughs> right, uh, into the CIA. And Dulles became obsessed with the concept of mind control. And he felt that mind control was going to be the key to winning the next war. Perhaps we could win the war without so much destruction, without so many deaths of people. That was kind of the ethical judgment of this. But it really began with looking at drugs, drugs of all kinds, heroin, cocaine, mescaline, uh, LSD was a very significant one. This is where Sidney Gottlieb really got involved. He was a chemist. He was brought in to be uh, sort of Dulles's uh, technical chemist, chemical guy. And so um, in the, in the book where I'm at, they're still basically just still kind of figuring out that, that chemicals have limited impact and are not going to be trustworthy. And now I'm going to kind of jump ahead to say that we, we are at the same time, what's happening is what's known as Project Paperclip. And Paperclip was literally bringing about a thousand German scientists and rocket scientists, you know, rocket scientists, chemists, medical scientists into the country. But two particularly nasty ones, a guy named Kurt Blome, B-L-O-M-E, who was sort of the head of all of this biological warfare in the German uh, sphere. And then another guy named Shiro Ishii, who was the head of Unit 731 uh, in, it was in Manchuria. And so these two, mm -hmm. I won't belabor this, but these two were uh, brought in to really focus on the issue of how do we create uh, biological warfare, something that the U.S. refused to sign off of in the Geneva Convention of 1922. We were one of the few nations that did not agree not to do it. We basically left, the open, uh, left open the option. And, uh, and so Project Paperclip was bringing these scientists in. Now, skipping ahead, we're going to talk about Manchurian candidates. And, and I'm going to kind of stop now and talk, let you talk a bit about Manchurian candidates and 
Richard Condon and so forth. And then I'm going to kind of come back later and talk about my theory about Mengele. Mengele was not officially a paperclip scientist, but he comes into play in about 1951, 1952 in the United States. And, and this is my research and I'll talk about that, but I'm basically saying all these things to reinforce that what you're saying about his availability to influence you personally and the CIA, which is what I believed absolutely happened um, because it was later determined that mind control, trauma-based mind control was the only truly lasting effective way to create this Manchurian candidate, the assassins. So, and you had, you had a lot of this programming. You might talk, yes. if you would, yes. about the structured programming that was implemented in the CIA. It's different in my view. It uses the same, same kinds of techniques, but it's a very structured alpha, beta, delta, gamma, omega. You might talk right. about some of those things and, and the structuring because tr uh, so many of the folks out there that are listening to this that have been affected by trauma-based mind control, they've been in the CIA program, whether they realize it or not. And these are parts, these are the identities that have been programmed into them. So I'll stop yeah. and let you talk now. Okay. So I talked about um, if trauma comes in utero, that's when the baby is really right-brained. It's very easy for the splitting of the personality to happen or the soul. We call it the broke, Jesus called it the broken heart. Mm -hmm. So we have the splitting of the soul. Why does the splitting happen? Well, when there's trauma, a child doesn't have the capacity to deal with the trauma. If this is association, this is dissociation. So what the mind does is it moves away the offending memory, the, the trauma, the pain, it separates it away. And so what happens is a little part of self, let's say this, the trauma, the hand, the human hand is like the, in the Bible, the size of the heart. Mm -hmm. So if I were to take a knife and cut at the heart, I would have a little piece that breaks off. This little piece will break off and it will be age arrested at the time of the trauma. So if a child is three years old, when there's a severe trauma, this little one will be three. And this little one will hold the trauma memory and it will have demonic on it from the trauma. But it will also, if this little one has been programmed, it will have instructions. And so mind control programming is done by taking the broken pieces of the heart and giving them, the programmer gives them an identity and an instruction, sort of like a computer system, the little alter becomes the operator and the programmer gives an instruction, which is the software that runs the program. What you're and describing so is, is what I believe, and I believe you believe, Mengele taught the CIA, and and then this this system was developed. You know, it's very compartmentalized, but it's had vast impact. And many yes. counselors have written books about it, and they're criticized mm -hmm. for it. But this goes back even to like 1994, 95. A guy named Corey Don Hammond that wrote a book going through all these different programs. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So, um, so what they do when they start programming children, they'll start with a small story like a nursery rhyme. They'll teach the child the nursery rhyme and they will build an association with the nursery rhyme. So the child's mind will associate something specific with the little nursery rhyme. And then they will use music because the brain, like children learn how to their ABCs with a song. So they want to train this child to do something. They will use a song. They will use nursery rhymes. And when I teach this in my academy, I, I start by teaching ministers how to recognize everything from nursery rhymes to songs to full movie scripts that are used for the mind control programming. And what the programmer does, so let me say, let me back up just a little bit. So let's say someone grows up in an alcoholic family and dad is really abusive and angry 
A child could have broken pieces of the heart from that, but they're not going to be organized. A mind-controlled slave, a Manchurian candidate, the parts inside are organized. They're organized by layer, sometimes by color, by number. Um, imagine it like a building with floors. And so the programmer will put specific things on specific floors and he will build in uh, internal conflict, even inside the system. He'll create parts inside the system that will punish if someone steps outside of their programming. So for example, a child is told you will not remember, you will not tell. That's the number one mind control program on every SRA survivor. The next one is suicide programming. You will not tell. If you tell, you will die. So the parts inside believe if we ever tell, we have to die. So we're never going to tell. Uh, so this creates internal conflict inside. And so the programmer has to keep track of all these little programs that they create. Well, trauma, the more severe the trauma, the greater the amnesic barrier around the individual parts. The greater the amnesic barrier, the more amnesia, the less likely this person will remember what we've done to them. So behind the amnesic barrier, they can train someone to be an assassin and they would, this front part would never know. And so I can say for me, I was trained as an assassin. I had parts that could use a rifle. Um, I had parts that um, knew all kinds of things. I had parts that were witches. I mean, I was absolutely horrified to find witchcraft parts inside of me because I love Jesus. I'm like, Lord, what is this? And so- There, there um, I ask you to talk a little bit about underground military bases and- where some of this sure. occurs. I, I do have some memories at um, Cheyenne Mountain, NORAD. Uh, my father was a pilot. So in my story, there were lots of places I went. So not only was there access to military aircraft, but my dad was a pilot. Um, my father worked for Lockheed, so did all the other members of my family. So there was deep military connections to the Navy and to NASA. I was connected to Stanford research. Um, so, uh-oh. You were, yeah, you were, I, you, I you, rabbit you trail. had the full, you had the full plate. I had the full, yeah, the full yeah. thing. And, and when so, I oh, so earlier, I was going to say when I mentioned earlier the 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 Greek letters or you know alphabet mm -hmm. I mean you relate Let's to that do. as well right I mean you Oh absolutely aware of that. yeah So when I teach um, how to break mind control programming I teach ministers to break it at the different brainwave states so the conscious brainwave state is beta so if someone's conscious and you tell them wear a mask and you tell them often enough to wear a mask, they will believe that wearing a mask is the right thing to do. And so now we've got a whole population of people mind control program to wear a mask. So we repeat it often enough, people will believe it. So that's, that is beta level programming, this conscious programming. Alpha programming is just underneath that. And so people, you might recognize an alpha state, a brainwave state, when it's just before you fall asleep or just before you wake up. So a lot of survivors will report to me that they have memories come back in that alpha state. A lot of sexual programming is done for little girls. I had a lot of sexual programming. Um, so uh, in an alpha brainwave state, they teach the little girls how to please men. And this is where the sex trafficking. And I do want to say this, you know, we're aware that there's sex trafficking, but most people are not aware of the levels of mind control and SRA that are associated with sex trafficking. Right. It's all the same animal. So that's um, alpha state. The next state is theta and theta is like a light trance state 
which is where um, if people go into a psychic trance, um, it's kind of a, like a dream state. Right. So uh, theta level programming is psychic programming. So our U.S. government spent many millions of dollars studying psychic programming. And I, I remember sessions at Stanford Research Center where they did theta level programming with me and testing, psychic testing and that kind of thing. And then the next level is Delta and Delta is an unconscious state. Well, that's where, um, that's where the military programming is. And so uh, when they do military programming, they put it down really deep. And for a minister to get to it, you actually have to call the Delta level altars forward and uh, administer to them. So when you see things like the shootings, um, the various shootings that the Illuminati have set out as red herrings or red flags, um, a lot of the time you will hear stories about someone that came in kind of military and kind of in a trance state. They looked like they were in a trance state with a machine gun and started shooting things up. That's Delta level programming. Right. So there are other, there's other levels um, and there's other, what I would call types of programming, like Omega programming is end times programming. There's Epsilon, there's Rho programming. Rho is space and location programming. So there are a lot of different levels, a lot of different ways that it operates, but very consistently they will, um, and they'll use an EEG machine, the programmer will, to, um, to train the victim how to get into the various brainwave states and they will reward them for getting into the various states quickly. All right. And they can use the EEG machine to determine if they're in that state and then they do the programming. Now, the dangerous thing is unconscious programming. There's no filter. The brain has no filter with that. So if I'm a programmer and I render you unconscious, I can just stuff things inside your unconscious mind, which is really dangerous because the unconscious can drive behaviors that people don't understand Mm. why they're having those behaviors. So just to reinforce what you're saying, which is, which is consistent with all the reading and research I've done is that, that this was brought on in our government predominantly by Dulles, by a guy named Jolly and West, a guy named John Gittinger, a guy named Sidney Gottlieb, and a guy named Joseph Mengele. These were the purveyors of this. And this was, as you can hear from Kay's testimony, extremely systematic. It was very much a part of a military strategy, part of a, an intelligence strategy. And it was viewed by those that started this, that this was This was the next thing, and this was the way that wars needed to be fought in the future, and it was the way that, frankly, you would control our own population, and projects sprung up like Project Mockingbird, which basically was to go out and to uh, basically take control of all of the media, and how many of you listening to this program trust the media to tell you the truth about things? Well, since as early as the 1960s, the media was almost already taken over by Project Mockingbird. And so it's all part of the program to control and reinforce the American system, the American values, at the same time to attempt to uh, defeat our enemies. And of course, the question is, are we the enemy? Are we worse than the enemy? Because we use these techniques and we obviously use this type of mind control to create these types of assassins and so forth. Talk a bit, if you would, about the Manchurian candidate. Some, some of the folks will be younger and they won't remember Frank Sinatra. They might know the newer version of it with Denzel Washington, but uh, similar stories, but talk a bit about that. So um, 1959, Richard Condon wrote The Manchurian Candidate. Now you have to remember that one of the things about the Illuminati is they will tell you what they're gonna do before they do it. And so I believe they used Richard Condon to um, 
alert the public that this is what they were doing. Um, so in the, in the movie and in the book, um, they take some soldiers and um, they torture them and they traumatize them and they mind control them and they send them home. Well, in the original uh, 1962 version with Frank Sinatra, they did the programming with a set of playing cards, which is very interesting um, because they still do programming with playing cards. And even though we don't use old fashioned telephones, uh, that there is a telephone in the movie. Actually, my students have to watch the, the movie as part of their training. It's the trigger, right? We right, the trigger. The trigger a lot. Mm -hmm. And the callback. Uh huh. Yeah. So, so what you need to understand about a trigger is the brain. So, if there's been a trauma, the thalamus will record what's called triggers to protect you. So, the thalamus will look for triggers, and if it says, "Oh, that reminds me of that trauma," the thalamus will come alert. Well, what happens with uh, broken pieces of the heart? The fragmented parts that have been dissociated is they operate on triggers. So all a programmer has to do is instill a trigger and then call that trigger up at a later point to get that particular trained personality forward. So in the movie, um, in the movie, the man that's the main character. Or it's Desi Lawrence Harvey. Lawrence Harvey. Oh, the, yes, that's he's right. The, he's also the, <laughs> the guy that played the, the leader at the Alamo. My, one of my favorites. <laughs> 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 he, he was uh, Travis. He was Travis, the colonel that was running the Alamo. <laughs> Go ahead. So it was a very simplistic uh, way of explaining mind control, but this man had been programmed with playing cards that when he sees the Queen of Diamonds, he's to do whatever he's instructed when he sees the Queen of Diamonds. So in the movie, he goes to the bar to have a drink and they're playing solitaire and he plays solitaire and up comes the Queen of Diamonds and he overhears the bartender say, oh, buddy, go jump in the lake. <laughs> and so he gets up from his bar stool and goes and jumps in the lake. That's really how mind, that's a very simplistic version of how mind control works. But this man was also programmed um, as an assassin and to kill. And he didn't even know that he was programmed to do that. Now here's the dangerous thing. After the Korean War, disturbing new intelligence reaches Washington. Hundreds of American troops are still being held captive subjected to brainwashing experiments, and then killed. Mind control research back home intensifies. The new goal is to cause an individual to become subservient to an imposed control, to the point where he will perform acts against his will and then have no memory of the act. The search for a real-life Manchurian candidate begins. To produce such an assassin, the CIA faces two main challenges, how to induce amnesia and how to program in new behavior. In 1957, Dr. Ewan Cameron, an eminent psychiatrist in Montreal, believes he has the answers. Cameron applies his techniques under the guise of normal therapy. There's a three-part technique which started with an effort to wipe out past patterns of behavior. And this was accomplished through the use of particularly intensive, repeated, high-level electroshocks until no more convulsions could be elicited from a patient. Cameron then plays tape-recorded messages through helmets that are locked to his patients' heads. This psychic driving forces them to listen to repetitive statements for weeks on end to program in new behavior. You know, the final phase was to try to wipe out all recollection of what had happened, and that was accomplished by putting people to sleep for 30, 40 days, accompanied by different kinds of cocktails of drugs. Now, that's not any kind of therapy. That's a brainwashing experiment. People don't know that they're mentoring candidates, and that is what is most dangerous. If you don't know what's back there, you don't know that you've been programmed, 
then anyone that knows your programming and knows your triggers can call up alters in the back of the mind. And these people could be leaders in political, in, in governments, right? Right. Very so high here's, level people. <laughs> that's a scary thing, isn't it? It is. So um, one of the things, so sometimes I watch to see what movies Disney is putting out because Disney is really the propaganda arm of the CIA. And so if Disney puts out a new version of Alice in Wonderland, what are they doing? Most uh, survivors, at least baby boomers, have Alice in Wonderland programming. So they re-release the movie. Every time you're watching TV, there's an ad for Alice in Wonderland. It reinforces and re-triggers the programming. So theoretically, all that would have to happen in the end times with all these programmed people is for them to send something out over the radio waves, send something out over television, show an image, and they could essentially activate super soldiers or Manchurian candidates right, to create right. chaos. And um, the chaos is intentional so that they can kind of sweep in as the heroes and bring in the new world order. Yeah, amen. Um, a little bit more history now. The um, the, the characters I mentioned, uh, the rogues gallery of the folks that are involved in, in doing this in, inside the government, um, it was exposed and in the congressional record in the 1975-1976 Otis Pike and Frank Church committees uh, in Congress, the, the Un-American Activities Committee. And it was uh, fleshed out and detailed and, and many of the CIA uh, folks, including Gottlieb and Richard Helms and others, were were there. They testified. Yes, we did that. But we don't do that anymore. You know, we stopped that. And um, and it was it was caught because of some accounting that was left in the White House that Helms thought he had destroyed all of the records of all of the project uh, of Monarch, uh, Blue, you know, Bluebird, Artichoke, uh, MK Ultra. Um, a quick sidebar: um, the um, the the Unabomber was a victim of uh, MK Ultra programming. That's even brought out in the recent movie. Um, and so we know this was, in fact, uh, something that was a, that was known. Uh, turns out that both Church and Pike, by the way, lost the next election. I wonder why. Uh, so they were removed from uh, Congress and the Senate. Um, and uh, and so. In about 1979, a book was written by a guy named John Marx called In Search of the Manchurian Candidate. And in Marx's book, he talks about all of these drug, uh, the, the basically drugs and hypnosis as a means of programming. And ultimately, his conclusion was it was not successful and it was therefore stopped. This was a great lie because what had actually happened was, as I, as I maintain, it was learned that what Kay's been describing is, in fact, the effective method to do the Manchurian candidate. And it's far more, it's resilient, it can be accessed, it can be called upon, and that's why it's so extremely dangerous. And, um, and so this has been, again, documented now quite well by, by very responsible, both trained psychologically, psychiatrists, as well as uh, uh, Christians and counselors in, that are, you know, scripturally uh, tuned in and so forth. And, uh, and so, and it's been, it's well known. Unfortunately, it's not well known amongst the church. So I wanted to, to shift and talk a little bit more about some of your biography, Kay, and some of the specific things that you went through. Um, we'll take another 10 or 15 minutes and talk about, you know, maybe, uh, you know, kind of your brothers and sisters, your mother and father, the relationships there, and uh, and ultimately get into some of the things that were perhaps the most sensational things that you talk about in your biography. Um, you've already mentioned Mingala. We don't have to talk about that, but we could talk a bit about the uh, the relationship with the Catholic Church, the Pope. Um, and I'm curious why you think the Catholics have frequently been connected with this kind of uh, abuse? 
Well, um, if you want me to, if you want me to launch in now? Yeah, mm-hmm. go ahead and launch in. We're going to save the last part. We're, we're going to deal with is is some of the sort of the ministry uh, aspects of things. And but right now we want to talk a little bit more about some of these. Uh, you know, I think that that folks need to know um, some of these. These are more sensational things, but it it exposes the level of depth that this goes to, not just in the U.S. government, but in the Catholic Church and the Mormon mm-hmm. Church and Freemasonry and all of that is very much uh, involved. So, yeah, please go ahead and launch in, and we'll we'll take the time that we need. All right. Okay. All okay. right. Well, I'll start with a, a little bit about my family, and then I'll I'll lead on to the Catholic Church. So, um, my mother was Catholic. My father um, was the Livingston line, and he was Protestant. We're Protestant, honey. He would say. Mm-hmm. Okay, whatever that is. Right. right. And so, um, my father had uh, let me backtrack a little bit. Yep. My grandfather on my father's side was a chemist. Interesting. We're talking about the drugs and the chemistry. He was the vice president of Monsanto mm-hmm. in St. Louis, Missouri. Mm-hmm. So, my father and his siblings were raised in quite a bit of affluence and wealth in, um, in St. Louis. I believe my father was ritually abused and um, all of his siblings as well. And so my father went to Princeton and when he was uh, a young man, uh, he was going for a medical degree and uh, World War II broke out. So he went to Germany. And what's interesting to me is my father spoke German and he loved the German people. He just, he often would speak of the German people. He loved the German people. Well, what's very interesting is a lot of SRA survivors actually have parts inside that speak other languages. I can't tell you how many survivors I've met that speak German. And they like, I didn't, I took a year of it in school, I, but I, I could speak it fluently. Just, you know? just a quick comment. It, there's something about this programming that, in t- that powers of the human mind that you know, like Kathy O'Brien talks about in her book, being used by Kissinger is is basically like a recorder. She could read documents, memorize them, and he would just say, you know, he'd do a search like she was a computer, do a search, pull back information, she'd have it. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. So, so my father um, came, uh, flew zeppelins in the war. He was in the navy. He was an officer. Um, he came back, he finished his degree, he had three children and a wife, and he left them for my mother, some mm-hmm. tawdry affair he had. Well, I believe my mother was a very high-ranking witch, and um, mm. so they got married, they moved to, to California, and when they were both 40, I was born, And my half siblings, my father's children from his first marriage um, came out to California to live with us. So I had what I thought was a fairly normal childhood. I didn't, I, you know, I was the youngest uh, in the family. I was the only child my mother had. Uh, When I was eight, my father took off for the Philippines to start a business a soap business. Supposedly, right. Supposedly, right. I think he was running guns um, and doing some child trafficking. Anyway, he was gone. He went into hiding for years. My mother remarried um, someone at Lockheed. So my mother worked at Lockheed. My father worked at Lockheed. My stepfather, both my brothers. Mm. Lockheed was the family business. You have to work at Moffitt um, Field too, right? Out in some of this. Yes, Moffitt so Field. Related mm-hmm. to that too. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the family was, you know, deeply connected, deeply involved. Um, I didn't, I ran away from home at 14 and I didn't discover, um, I knew I was emotionally a mess. I didn't know why. Uh, But I didn't discover the SRA until I was in my, the latter part of my, like 25, 26 years old before I discovered the SRA. Mm -hmm. And then I I started to look back and think, well, how could this have happened? And, you know, where did this happen? Um, I have a number of memories in South America. 
I was uh, a number of memories with Mangala in South America. And if you want, even um, I can talk about uh, meeting a royal family in um, Argentina. And I believe this was with Megala. I believe it was Prince Bernard of the Netherlands. Ah, okay. Who had contracts with Lockheed. Yeah. So, and he's, all in and the he's family. a key figure in the formation of the Bilderbergers, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, the Bilderbergs. Yeah. And then he was connected with Mangala yeah. in, in that area. So, I have memories in South America, several of them. Um, and then a memory that happened. Um, I had memories of uh, Catholic related things in the States. And then I had a memory remembering because I was just seeing the pictures. I didn't know what I was looking at. Um, but I later, as I researched, I was like, oh my goodness, this was the Vatican. So I remember seeing him being told what an honor it was to be with this man with the red shoes. And I was taken to a bathe with this man. And then um, I was raped by, by this man. And then later brought back to the Vatican to have his child. And that was... Um, you, were, you were approximately 15, 16, 17? When that occurred? No, I was younger than that. You were younger than that. Okay. Mm -hmm. This was before you ran away from home, basically. Before I ran away from home. So I was going back in my history, remembering things. And I had well over a hundred memories mm -hmm. and they were, they were awful. Right. <laughs> it was, right. Yeah. It was a lot of years of therapy and counseling to get me through all those memories. But um, just a brief second, because a lot of people don't understand why it is that that these power players find it necessary to uh, one counselor talks about uses a euphemism interface, which is basically rape um, a, a person such as yourself that had been through all of the ritual abuse, but all of the empowerment from all of the generational bloodlines and all that. And that seems to be though, a constant theme that you hear amongst um more high level like that have the the bloodlines like yourself um any comments any comments there okay so the bible says that when when um there's sexuality the two become one mm. so when a man rapes a child not only does he impart to the child but he steals from the child and so but yes, it is the high level bloodlines. Not everybody gets to go to the Vatican and be raped by the Pope. That's right. Um, That's right. <laughs> I, it was an honor. Unless you're Beyonce. Or... <laughs> Pro Sorry. Probably right. <laughs> but we're not making that Oops. allegation. We don't have any. We don't have any. I don't know. But, right. don't so, know. But, but I was told as a child what an honor this was. And so in the occult system, it was because I was getting from the Pope and the Pope was getting from me. Mm -hmm. And so, and then to have a baby and for him to sacrifice the baby, this was quite a sacrifice right. to Satan, right? right? This, this baby. So um, it's about power. It's about indoctrination. And it was about the quality of the sacrifice. Yeah. Yes. And, I'll go ahead and ask you to talk about um, you actually, and you'll have to kind of explain this to people how this is, is feasible. Um, but you apparently had as many as six child, six children that were obviously prematurely born and then sacrificed. I mm -hmm. guess, talk about this. This is just one of the most horrific aspects of your testimony. And yet it's something that needs to be mentioned. I just appreciate your sensitivity in that. Thank you. Uh, well, I've read your book twice, studied it very <laughs> carefully, underlined lots of things. And uh, I mean, your, your testimony is um, it's kind of the quintessential testimony of someone that has experienced things in sort of both sides of the, of the transom. I mean, all, you know, all these different themes, they all kind of interweave into, into your testimony. So that's why I find your, uh, 
you know, your counsel and your mentoring and your uh, education and your experience so beneficial. And hopefully those that are listening feel the same way. Thank you. Well, I'll start by saying um, um, when I was 24, 25, I um, got pregnant and uh, my husband and I, um, I was about seven months along in the pregnancy and all of a sudden I had panic attacks and insomnia like never before, just hysterical panic attacks. Um, and I didn't know why I didn't know what was causing it, but it started about seven months of gestation. And my doctor said, well, once you have the baby, you'll be fine. So, you know, they were trying, you know, take some Benadryl, calm down. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Well, the closer it got to my due date with the baby, I was just, I was a wreck. I was just, and I didn't know why, and nobody could tell me why. So I just felt like a crazy person. I had to have a cesarean. Um, I had 36 hours of labor. My body would not let go of the baby. And so they had to do a cesarean and they took my baby. Mm. And I remember screaming at my husband, don't let them take the baby. Don't let them take the baby. And he was like, I won't, I'll watch the baby, calm down. And so I just felt like a crazy mom. I was super overprotective, but I, you know, I got over it and 18 months later, I'm pregnant again. And so, okay, well, this time I'm in counseling. And part of the counseling was this insomnia thing that would happen at seven months of gestation. So I'm pregnant with my son and I start to remember sexual abuse memories and, and those just got worse and worse. And then I had my first ritual abuse memory while I was pregnant with my son. And it was just horrific, just horrific. Once he was born, um, about three months later, I'm seeing my counselor and I started to have a body memory as though I was in labor again. Mm. And she said, you look like you're in labor. And I, I mean, I was in the full contractions, the whole thing. And I had my first memory of giving birth. Is that and called an ab, ab reaction? An ab reaction. I like relived the whole thing. Right, right. Today, today we don't have to do all of that. But back then, that's all we knew to do for healing. Right. Right. And so I had this memory of this baby and I knew the baby had been murdered. And I, I, here I have this memory, like this just happened. Like my baby just died. I don't have a baby. I don't have a body. I, my husband's like, that's nuts. I don't believe that. Right. So nobody believed my therapist was the only person to believe me. I couldn't like tell people, gee, I had this memory that I had this baby that my mother murdered. And that was the, the memory was that my mother murdered my baby. And so my therapist was like, well, quit talking to your mom. <laughs> <laughs> She's not your counselor here. <laughs> right. Oh so subsequently over the years, I recovered, um, I recovered memories of six total. One was at the Vatican um, the first one when I was about, I think I was about 10. Yeah. And then, um, so there were, there were six. So I can't tell you, you know, going to the lady doctor once a year, seeing a new doctor, I remember the nurse saying to me, so how many babies have you had? And I was like eight. And she said, well, and how many are living? And I said, two. And I just burst into tears. Okay. So, you know, oh, my. Oh. Uh, just uh, you know, that, amazing what you had to go through there. Explain how, how that could be possible. Cause people are going, I can't believe that. How, you know, what, the calendar, how does that, how does that work? How could she have done that? So when a child is very young, their muscle structure is very good. Um, so they would time, they would um, do the, they would impregnate during a ritual and they would time um, so that my belly would be bigger in the summer and that, but I didn't know I was pregnant. 
So if you don't know you're pregnant, you just are eating too much. So kicks in an eating disorder. I'm getting fat. I've got to quit eating. And so that's what happened to me. That's what happens. And then you would be, you would be then taken, you know, basically you're amnesiac. You know, you don't know this Mm -hmm. is going on. At seven months. Yeah. Seven months and you're taken and the, the baby's delivered. It's blue. It's, you know, not going to live on its own at that time. They can't, but it's used then as a sacrifice. And, uh, and so the sacrifices I assume were done by various, not just the Pope, but various people at different times. You don't mention in the book, the father, I assume that some of this may have been your father. It could have been others that were involved in these rituals. Um, I don't even know if you were able even to know uh, because of the nature of the abuse, the abuse that you went through. Well, the, the first actual medical in, so, you know, if people want a little evidence, here's my little bit of evidence. Um, so when I was 17, I was living with my father temporarily and I started hemorrhaging. I mean, just hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging. So they had to run me to the emergency room. And I remember my father just pacing. He was so nervous. He was just pacing. And um, so I ended up going to a specialist at Stanford. And he said to me, when did you have this baby? And I said, what baby? I was completely amnesic. What baby? And he said, there are, there is evidence here of vaginal scarring. So, um, when did you have the baby? And then he pulled me in his office and he's like, is your dad sexually abusing you? What's happening? And I was like, no, everything's fine. Completely amnesic. Mm -hmm. Well, when I started to remember having the, started having the memories about the babies, I actually called for the medical records because I remember him very clearly doing that. And the medical records had been scrubbed. Mm. Conspiracy is just all part of the game. It's all part of the story. And, uh, you know, the, obviously the, the, those that are go, going through this trauma, they're taught not to remember, to stay silent. Uh, those that are surrounding them, that are doing the abuse, that are conscious of it, they're all part of, uh, all part of this plan. And that's, that's what they must do. Otherwise, they're going to be subject to some type of uh, torture or death themselves, I assume. Well, also, and in, in to discredit someone as their first line of defense. Oh, she's crazy. Oh, that's crazy. Right. And so they they actually use the mental defense of denial very effectively. And right. so most most survivors, if they so here's the program is um, whatever you do, don't tell. No one will believe you and they will think you're crazy and then they'll lock you up forever. Right. So that was, that was the threat. And that my own husband said that to me, whatever you do, don't tell people these things. They'll think you're crazy. Yeah, you're crazy. No one will believe you. Yeah. So it's pretty hard to heal when your own family is either a perpetrator or in denial or not willing. Right. And so actually that was the demise of marriage. And oh, i yeah, I just, I feel for you. Well, this last point on this, and then we're going to turn to, to therapy uh, and, how, and how to begin to work with these kinds of issues. Um, you talk about the marriage with Mengele, and, uh, and this also gets into, I think, a, a pretty shocking experience of, of what you went through probably with Prince Bernard and his queen, uh, mm-hmm. as well as with Yosef. Um, um, mention that. I, I'm curious as to what you made of the, the necessity of the marriage to Mengele, other than the fact that this man was as close. He wasn't, he wasn't antichrist. Uh, some have said even Hitler was afraid of him. Um, so, uh, but anyway, mention that. And then we're going to, then we're going to take a, you and I are going to take a little break. We'll come right back though, in terms of the video and talk a little bit about uh, how we get well from these things. Satan is a legalist. Mm. Satan, they're legal. He's a legalist. And so in occult rituals, part of the objective is to create so much spiritual legal ground that someone can't get out from under it, especially if they don't know it's there. 
So an actual occult marriage, occult marriages are very common. So most programmers will marry their victim. Um, um, so uh, most warlocks, most witches, you know, copulate with each other. So they do marriage ceremonies as a form of ownership. So it's almost like a master slave contract. Yes. Um, so Mengele, um, Mengele set this thing up where I was to marry him. And it was um, um, horrific. Yes. And it, of course, of course, the ritual ends with sexuality and. Right. Well, and this is, I'm going to stop you because this is so, it, it's talked about in your book. I'll just leave it at that. Let's take, you and I are going to take like a five minute break. Uh, we'll be right back though with the viewers and we're going to, then we're going to talk about getting well. Okay. That sounds good. Good. Okay. okay thanks. We are back after a little break. We, we, were, we were both feeling the intensity of the, our discussion. And so I'm sure you as the viewer were feeling it as well. And so uh, we're going to, you know, move a little more into uh, still going to deal with some things that we have to probably lay out as background, but uh, begin to get a little bit more into, hey, you know, no matter how severe the trauma, you can get well. Uh, it does take time. It doesn't take as long as it has taken K to get through it because so much more has been learned by Kay and by others in terms of how to deal with um, the abuse and how to heal the parts and get rid of the demons based upon legal ground and not having to, as Kay would say, hit people in the head with the Bible. Uh, so uh, anyway, so I'm going to turn it back over to her and have her kind of, kind of bridge for us from where we were, what we were talking about into um, kind of setting the stage to talk about how we get well. All right, Kay. Thank you. Well, one of the things that we, we touched on, we talked a little bit about Catholicism and what happened for me at the Vatican. Um, but I think that it might help people to understand big picture a little bit in terms of organizations that perpetrate uh, satanic ritual abuse. So it's very well known that Masons have been perpetrating satanic ritual abuse uh, and the uh, LDS church, which is founded on Freemasonry. We also know there's a lot of satanic ritual abuse happening there. By the way, but, I'll just insert real fast that we're not saying all Mormons, nor all Catholics, right. nor all Freemasons. Right. No. It's just no. That, that these provide nice covers for those that, that do these things. They can fit within those organizations and not get exposed. Okay, go ahead. Very, very well said. Thank right. you. Uh, so one of the, the organizations that I think is very instrumental in mind control is the Jesuit order. Now, the Jesuit order was um, developed by St. Ignatius Loyola in the 1500s, and they were the military branch or the CIA branch of the Catholic Church. And they, so were the counter, were, they were the counter-reformation, right? They were formed... Exactly after Luther to attack the Protestant uh, Reformation. Okay, go ahead. Yes, yes. And so uh, I find a significant amount of mind control programming that is Jesuit programming as well. As a matter of fact, many times inside SRA survivors, I will find little Jesuit monks in there that have taken oaths to protect the Pope in the end times. So they've done this programming so that in the end times, people will rise up and protect the Pope. So kind of where the CIA is the American branch of this kind of intelligence, well, the Jesuit order is a form of the Catholic branch of that. And underneath, it is my belief, underneath Freemasonry and Catholicism, the common root is actually Mithraism. And Mithras, it was a counterfeit Christ, and 
Uh, I wrote a, a little book on that. I should have that um, back in print shortly. But uh, Mithraism, I've actually found this kind of programming on many SRA survivors, and it is hidden so deeply inside. I remember one lady I worked with, there were nine nine security programs around the Mithras programming to hide it. So really the, the deep down root underneath some of these occult organizations really uh, drills right down to Mithraism, which is form of counterfeit Christianity. So mm. <clears throat> very interesting. Makes sense. It Look. makes sense. Mm -hmm. right? Very strategic on the part of the, on the part of Satan. Very. And then I look at programming today. And as you said, you know, the, the Mason, it's, you know, it's been kind of going downhill for the last 60 years or whatever. But maybe they don't need trauma based mind control programming so much anymore. Yep. Because they've got technology-based mind control programming. Yep. Maybe what they did with SRA survivors during that were baby boomers like me from the 40s through the 60s and then beyond baby boomers into the 70s, maybe we were an experiment to see, can we mind control a person? What does it take to control or create a Manchurian candidate for the for our end times purpose, a slave that doesn't know they're a slave. And then we start getting into the 80s and 90s and then into um, this new era and people are easily programmed with television programming. So maybe the technology base, they can program many people on a much broader scale, cost them much less money and less trauma. There's so, something called neuro-linguistic programming. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Mm -hmm. That is that part of what the technology is, would you say? That's part, that's just very simplistic, very okay. simplistic. But yes, but you can look at video games where people have avatars and worlds and they create these things. That's all mind control. Yep. So I think that we need to be thinking about how is mind control affecting us today? Because today we have a media, people aren't trusting the media, but they're releasing the same messages. They're using media sources, sort of like Hitler did during the times of the Third Reich, all to bring in and usher in a Fourth Reich. So I think that the American public and the, the world at large needs to be. You're breaking up here right there. I'm praying hard. We're getting, are you there? Can you still hear me? Yes, I can still hear you. Okay. All right. All right. With my I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna to say to the people, I'm going to say, I'm going to make one point here. Okay. Kay broke for a second. I'm going to make one quick point that uh, Walter Lippmann, who wrote Public Opinion, and uh, Joseph Goebbels were trained at the same time in the same place. Uh, and you remember Goebbels was the propaganda minister for the Third Reich. Okay, and, and Lippmann was, you know, an American intellectual that influenced the way that the media works. Okay, having said that, okay, go pick it back up. <laughs> right, so, so I think that we need to become aware of how we are being influenced in our culture, in our thinking, um, through technology sources, because they don't have to do all this trauma-based mind control to create puppets out of people anymore. So that's a that's yeah. something we need to become aware of. Well, let's let's talk. Let's kind of shift gears a little bit, and we'll talk a little bit about healing and what does it take to heal from um, satanic ritual abuse and mind control programming, DID. Um, so I would, I would say that ritual abuse is spiritual abuse. So one of the most important characteristics of any healing, um, any healing work with survivors has to be spiritual. 
And in, in my experience, um, the healing only really deeply takes place where the spirit and the soul heal and the emotions heal is when Jesus Christ is part of that process. So I find that therapists that are willing to bring Jesus into the session, um, that they can be very, very effective. But then we've also got the components where deliverance is needed. I remember the first uh, counselor that was a pastor that worked with me, he said, well, Kay, what do you think they do in those rituals? I said, well, Christians can't have demons. And he said, well, give me a minute. I'll prove it to you. <laughs> and within about a minute, I was uh, riding on the, you know. You heard, new, you heard new voices that you didn't know you could make. <laughs> yeah, right. So, uh, so part of the healing process really requires expert deliverance care. Now, I think we have to take deliverance from the hitting people on the head with the Bible, which is what people did with me, mm -hmm. um, which wasn't very effective. We have to get really effective and deal with spiritual legal ground and as well as emotional care in the process of breaking down the rituals. So I find that people really heal when ministers are knowledgeable about what the rituals are and how to break, um, break high levels of witchcraft. The other thing is that mind control programming is always layered in with demonic. Demonic is sort of like the security system that's layered into the programming. So Deliverance ministers that are really effective uh, can do inner healing and you never do deliverance at the expense of the well-being of someone's emotions, but emotional care, deliverance, and then the um, breaking the power of the programming message. So all three of those really have to take place and, and, and with Jesus in the center. And what I find is that people are that are willing to yield to the Lord, willing to trust him. And that's hard when they've been abused. But the more, more um, deeply committed a person is to their faith in Christ and their life in Christ and relationship in Christ, the faster they heal. And so what I see today is um, I can see thousands of altars integrate at one time. Um, and I find that breaking the programming, when altars integrate, that breaks the program. Because if you remember, the, pro the altar is the operator. Mm -hmm. kind of the hardware that moves the program. If you integrate the altar, then the program doesn't work. So then why do you need to break the programming? Well, you have to break the programming to get to all the altars, yeah. all the little broken pieces of the heart in the back. Mm -hmm. And so the most effective ministry can flow with the Holy Spirit on all of those components at one time. And I've seen miraculous healings in people. Uh, what took me 30 years, I've seen people be able to do in two to three years. And sometimes people say, well, so that's still too long, but there's a lot of work that has to be done to clean up the generational lines. So usually there's you know, a significant amount of Freemasonry that needs to be broken and false religious structures. And so there's, there can be a significant amount of work well, and, to and it. For all of us Christians, we are all works in process, right? Absolutely. <laughs> we start at different points, but we are all, you know, uh, Christ is, is uh, you know, I don't know if it's more like uh, what someone said. It's not that we're getting more of Christ. It's that Christ is getting more of us, you know, yes, and yeah. more and more of what we are and think and believe and feel is being taken under and put under the throne of, of Christ. And so, uh, yeah, it makes, makes sense. How does a person know if they have been ritually abused? It took you a long time to figure that out. Person that's listening to this, what would you tell them about how they might discover, you know, what would be some, maybe some attributes, characteristics that they could assess 
themselves to say, gee, this might be me. But there can be um, a lot of red flags. Um, statistically, they say SRA survivors, pardon me, can spend seven years in therapy on average before they even discover the ritual abuse. So how do you know you're a ritual abuse survivor? So um, some of the things that are red flags to me where I can, I recognize it. Uh, one is where there's a really significant demonic load where people are, you know, being tormented at night, um, struggling with emotional, spiritual, physical problems, because this type of abuse has such a broad impact on a person that all those areas of their life will be impacted. Now, so um, lots of nightmares. I was going to say, they're typically lots of addictions. Typically. Yes, nightmares, addictions, yep. um, lots of spiritual problems. Pro like many survivors will say, you know, I would go to church, but I get so triggered. I just cry in church. Well, that's because when they do communion or whatever, it might be triggering, reminding them of the satanic communion. Mm -hmm. So those can be symptoms too. Um, a fear of Jesus is a symptom. Uh, many survivors I've worked with actually have little false Jesus is inside. And so um, what has happened is the programmer has dressed up like Jesus and then abused the child. So the child then is terrified of Jesus. So that can be a symptom. Um, panic attacks, DID. Now, a lot of people are DID, but when you find... Um, just a, a very significant pattern of DID uh, and internal conflict, those are symptoms as well. Some other things that I look at are military background. I look at royal bloodlines are a huge indicator of SRA. Yeah, I was going to I was going to mention uh, loss of time. Yes, that's a that's one of the key indicators of DID. Oh, yes. But when it people was start like the healing, last three hours or the last three days, I don't remember. <laughs> you know, that, huge that, blocks of time. Is it yeah. people? I've had people say to me, "Is it normal not to remember from nine years old to 14? Yeah, I'm like no, it's not normal. Not normal, right? Um, it is normal for people to have kind of spotty memory from one to five. After that, they should remember. But where we where people have large blocks, memory blocks of time, those are indicators of DID and highly likely indicators of trauma-based abuse. Yeah. You you talked about based programming. Yes. You talked about the church. Man, oh man, what a you know question to put upon you. But you know, is there hope that the church can actually wake up to these issues and, and find ways to minister to its people. Obviously, a lot of churches are caught up in it. They're teaching false Christianity. They're teaching false Christ. But, but there are those pastors out there that are sensitive to this. They know this is real, and mm -hmm. they want to do what they can. How, what do you think? What's the formula for the church to get, get right again on this kind of issue? I really, you know, where the presence of God is, if we can host the presence of God, which is true worship, true Davidic worship, it's that deep, deep yielding and commitment to Christ, where the presence of God comes in, that presence, you know, evil spirits will manifest around the presence. So, you know, <laughs> uh, that one of the things the church is missing is the presence of God. So if we can bring the presence of God back in to, um, into our lives, I don't even care if it's in the church building, because really the word church is people. It's yeah. not a building. Yeah. So we have, we've gotten in this Greek mindset, this Greek structure that is so far from true Christianity that if we will come back to the spirit of God and the, a real yielding and devotion. Now I say yielding because that was one of the hardest things for me was to trust God. I had hard enough time trusting authority or trusting people or trusting my husband or, 
but trusting God, well, he let this happen. How can I trust God? So one of the one of the most important things that God did in my life is bring me to a place where of totally yielding to him, where I finally had enough love an intimate love relationship with Christ where I said, okay, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to yield. Mm-hmm. And wow, that significant healing really started to happen when I would yield. This, well, me, Americans it, don't like to yield. No, I was going to say to me, this, you're exactly right. This is really the meaning behind, you know, that, that the spirit cannot, you know, if, if any spirit cannot confess that Jesus is Lord. You know, you're not dealing with the Holy Spirit, you know, right. do, you, do you find if you found the people that you've counseled with can choke on that? You know, do, does that come up, you know, specifically, you know, testing the spirit and, and so forth? Is that at all an issue in today's experience, do you think? Well, most people, um, re- I think all people need some deliverance, everybody, no sure. matter what. Sure. And it used to be. In early church, when someone was saved, they would do, they would, before they baptize them, they deliver them. Um, And it used to be that um, sons would confess the sins of their fathers. That's Ezekiel 22, 30. That's what Nehemiah did, where they would, they would confess the sins of their fathers. Well, who better to know the sins of the father than his son? So if we were to consistently be cleaning up our bloodlines for hundreds of years, we wouldn't have such so much demonic Mm -hmm. operating in family systems. So I think deliverance is a big part of it. And we can't be trying to control Holy Spirit, control prophecy, control Holy Spirit. Well, we're afraid to get out of control. Well, you've just asked the Holy Spirit to leave. Yeah. So, you know, you right. can't have it both ways. You can't right. control and have Holy Spirit, right? So you either yield, you either love him and yield and trust him or you don't. So if our, if our churches are to come alive, um, we, we have to host the presence of God and mm-hmm. he will do it. One comment I'd make, uh, Dr. Michael Heiser, who I think a lot of read a number of his books, he, he makes it really clear that when baptism occurred in the early church, it was very clearly articulated that it was dealing with you are moving from one kingdom to a different kingdom. You have been in the kingdom of darkness. And when you mm-hmm. go into the water and you come out, you're coming out into a different kingdom. You know, you're now yes. in the kingdom of light. And I think that's a very powerful part of baptism that we don't talk about. We don't know about. We aren't taught about, you know, so. Or death to self. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many people, I mean, really, if you want to be a follower of Christ, which is what being Christian is, a follower, well, my goodness, he suffered. He yielded. He said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Um, are we, are we really followers of Christ? Are we really willing to suffer? Are we really willing, um, to be persecuted, to put, lay it on the line? Are we willing to lay down our altars? I mean, one of the things that God asked of me, I mean, I, I lost my family a couple of years ago and the Lord was like, you know, you could have this Mm -hmm. with um or you can have my will for you right and part of it was idolatry Mm -hmm. like i was idolizing i was finding more comfort Mm -hmm. in um in a marriage i was more comfortable in something that wasn't godly Mm -hmm. um that so it became an idol Mm -hmm. and god was like are you willing to put down your idols So God, over the last couple of years, has addressed every idol in my life. I mean, everything, down to money, everything. In your, in your testimony, in your book, you, you know, it's, it's very clear. You are struggling with this for your whole marriage. There are times of healing. There are times when things are well, 
then there are times where things uh, kind of fall apart. The last thing I'll, I'll ask you to talk about, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up is false memory syndrome. Oh yeah. I, that's an important topic. Yeah. That's something that came up in my marriage. Um, my husband and I were married for, for 30 years, over 30 years. And we had um, separated at one time back in 2007 and SRA was a big part of it. I was like, this is, you know, you still not believing this is true for me. This hurts me. You're not supporting me in this area. And he came back from a Christian university with a binder on, please read this on false memory syndrome. I don't think I've ever been so mad in my life. <laughs> I was so, so mad about that. So um, let's talk a little bit about false memory syndrome. Um, there's a book that James Friesen wrote called The Truth About False Memory Syndrome. And I really believe that every, um, every family member that is challenged with recovery from SRA, every counselor, every minister needs to read this book. Um, he wrote it many years ago, but one of his quotes, one of the things he says is, if something is false, it can't be memory. There's no such thing as false memory. If it is truly memory, then there is truth in it. One of the things that happened with um, the false memory syndrome is it's not a true diagnosis, even though they tried to get it in the Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Man uh, Manual. It was not considered a true diagnosis, false memory syndrome. However, DID is recognized as a. Um, it, it, uh, it is. is a, yeah, it's an ICD nine GRG. It's it's something that Medicare will pay for, or medicine, you know, the insurance will pay for. It's a real, documented, uh, you know, issue. So it's the only organization in the world to systematically attack the reality of dissociation and ritual abuse. So then you have to ask yourself, well, why would that be? Mm -hmm. So if you were to research this, uh, the board of the false memory syndrome, you'll find many members are practicing occultists, psychiatrists, mind control experts. One of them publicly supported pedophilia in 1993. So I would well, say- fact, let, me, let me add, some of those guys I mentioned before, like Jolyon West and Sidney Gottlieb and some of these guys, they were they were founders of it, the, the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. And so they definitely had reasons to want to, to do that. And I'll just throw in one other little tidbit that Jolyon uh, West was the guy that interviewed uh, uh, Jack Ruby, Patty Hearst, uh, Sirhan Sirhan. Why wow. is he the guy that's always being picked to go interview these assassins or these people that have been abused like uh, Patricia Hearst was the Symbionese Liberation Army. Jolly on West, man oh man. These guys were at the beginning of this. So they were they were creating a counterattack to uh, to the liberation of uh, of those that were that were traumatized. Now I think that it's also important to say that sometimes programmers can put what I would call an artificial memory. Mm. So what is artificial memory? So artificial memory is when they try to create, maybe they use Photoshop or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they try and uh, create a false reality and then program the survivor with this false information. So, um, that can happen. And then there's a deliberate confusion of identity using programming. Like there's a program called um, rub a dub dub. Remember the nursery rhyme rub a dub dub three men in a tub? Yes. Well, that program is an identity eraser. So the child is told rub a dub dub, you're not going to see faces. Mm. So then I, I had this because I would remember all these things about the ritual, but I couldn't see faces. I couldn't figure out why can't I see faces? Well, that was the program. It's rub a dab dab, three men in a tab, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, and they all went out to see. So you will not remember their faces. Wow. 
So, um, so that kind of programming, you know, uh, creates a distortion of reality. When they give children drugs, uh, like LSD, that distorts reality. So there can be a distortion uh, and there can be something artificial, but there's no such thing as false memory. All so right. there's always something true about it, or it wouldn't be called memory. Right. Well, and it's, you know, again, if you're, if you're watching this and you think that this might you know, be part of the issues going on in your life, you know, prepare. Uh, the first thing that anyone you, that you know is going to likely say to you is that it's just a false memory or you're just, you know, you're just being silly. You're crazy. You remember it wrong, whatever. So you have to get past that prepare for that. And uh, so let's talk about resources. You've got some resources that folks can, uh, can check out. Uh, tell us a little bit about the website, how to get there and kind of what resources are there. So the website is RGM for Revelation Gateway Ministries, rgmconnect.com. And I do have a free resources page and you can click on there and there's some prayers and things up there that you can um, avail yourself of. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make available for free on the free resources page is a little booklet that I wrote called Serving SRA Survivors. And this particular booklet was written specifically so that counselors, ministers, family members, would have some idea what they're dealing with. So it's a brief little booklet. I'm going to make that available to people for free on the website. So you can go there and get that. I also um, will make available, there will be a, a charge for it, but it will have the booklet on Mithraism. Um, it's uh, about... Um, mind control programming and a little bit of history in there. So how to break Mithras programming right. that will be available. And I'm working on a couple of other books. So. All right. And then training classes, uh, a lot of what you do, uh, you focus on training ministers, training counselors and so forth. Talk uh, a minute about that, if you would. So I developed a, an academy years ago and um, I've run three teams through the academy. And the academy is uh, now a two year program. I've built a, a number of breaks into the program to make it easier for people to get, it's a marathon race. Um, well, these people have full time jobs. They're already doing ministry or whatever, right? So it's well, and it is a master's level, it is master's level curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, but if people are very serious about helping SRA survivors, and then um, I do 30 weeks on deprogramming. Yeah. So I teach people how to break programming, how to look for it, recognize it, and break it safely. Mm -hmm. And that's the operative word. Um, one of the things I don't want people doing is going, oh, here's the technique and go run out there. Because <laughs> what people need to know is mind control programming is layered in with bombs and um you know, demonic bombs, I'll put it that way, demonic bombs, and people are programmed to suicide and self-harm. So you have to be educated before you go breaking programming. Right, right. And let me make a point. Um, this is a, this is really a tough area because counselors um, and anyone like Kay, they have to be careful in terms of referrals because of the, you know, we live in such a litigious society. And so, um, you know, it's going to be important that that if you seek out a counselor, you need to do some due diligence on them. And I guess, Kay, can you speak for a minute about maybe a few things to look for, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a counselor? What is likely to tell you this is a person that's for real and isn't there as a, as a false counselor, which do exist? Well, I would say... Um... Definitely SRA survivors are sometimes programmed to go into fields like medicine or counseling or psychiatry. Um, so yeah, you want to be careful. I think the number one thing people need to learn to look for is the spirit of God in people. Like find out, do they have a vibrant relationship with Christ? 
because for me, that's the number one criteria. Right. Um, because really good ministry and counseling is going to be um, motivated by the Holy Spirit. So I do look for that. Also, I look for people that are very skillful in um, deliverance mm -hmm. and very skillful in emotional care. Should so, they demonstrate a track record of some kind, do you think? Well, certainly, yeah, I, and references. And I also want to say, you know, um, different people have different skill levels. And there's no harm in starting at one place with a good counselor and then saying, gee, now I want to do some deliverance work. And maybe that counselor doesn't do deliverance, but, you know, you can work with the counselor to go through the memories and you might work with someone else for deliverance and emotional care in that area. So um, there's no quick fix. It's no quick fix, right. No quick fix really, for any of us. Right. And really skilled ministers are and oh, they are a treasure. Yeah. So when you find a minister that's willing to walk through the horrors of ritual abuse, um just really honor them because you know, for me, I would I would have secondary trauma just listening to what people were going through sure. and really SRA really good SRA ministers burn out in like four years. Yeah, I burned awful. out in eight. So, you know, and I really had a heart for it. So, right. um, that's what I hear conscious yeah. of it's like a, it's like a tour of duty in the army almost, <laughs> you know, can't do this forever. So, right. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, in the in the, the show notes, uh, most of you will see this probably via a YouTube or something like that. Bit shoot, whatever. Um, I'll make sure that there's links there for case site. Also going to provide um, a couple of chapters that I'll carve out of my book on Power Quest Part Two, which deals with the, I call it the Ascension of Antichrist in America, and a lot of the book deals with this. Uh, type of activity that occurred in the history of it, the Mingala thing, some of the stuff that um, that I've researched and believe, but I'll put that there as well, that, that for those of you that want to study it a bit more, and um, and then we'll mention uh, case book titles and so forth, and then also um, you can send an email to info at rgmconnect.com and uh, Kay can look at your, uh, you know, request and then share that with uh, with others that she's aware of that might be possibly uh, a counselor that you can work with. It's not a referral. You have to, she'll probably give uh, <laughs> yours to like, you know, to three people. So you have to, to, to make a decision. It's not a decision she can make for you. So just make that plain. So Kay, last thoughts. Well, um, I just, I'm super grateful that you were so willing to take the time to really unpack this, mm -hmm. this particular topic. Um, so I'm very grateful for the way that you've done this. So many times I've done interviews and they're like, okay, five minutes, give me your testimony. <laughs> you know, right. and oh, you know, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, really. Yeah. Let's talk <laughs> about the I history say? of the United States in five minutes. <laughs> You know, <laughs> now uh, this, so uh, this uh, well, I've I'm been studying grateful. this myself for 12 years. So this is, you know, this is obviously something that, that I found uh, it, it is so to me, it's so strategic and it's so avoided. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we have to, we have to light the light in the darkness. You know, it's our duty and those that, that, uh, that watch this, that can share this with others. You know, mm -hmm. I charge you share it with others, make sure this information gets out. This is how we shine light into darkness. And this is a dark, dark area, as you know. So, um, Kay, you are just a wonderful person. And God has worked such miracles in your life. I'm so touched by your testimony and your ministry. By the way, I have gone through a two-day workshop myself on Freemasonry because my father, who's a wonderful man, lived to be 100. He was a 32nd degree Freemason, and he's also a good Methodist. And he discovered, he eventually figured it out. He wasn't an intellectual great man, but he finally figured out these two things aren't compatible. And I, he went to, I think, a funeral, a Masonic funeral. He goes, 
this is not something that a Christian should be doing. And so he, he walked away from it. So, uh, so I found it useful, renun- you know, renunciation of that Masonic, which was very much in my family bloodline, very much. And uh, so I, I'm not royal bloodline that I know. Well, actually, my brother says that we are. He did a bunch of tracing, so apparently I am too. But, but I haven't had these experiences, not at all like, like Kay. But Kay, it's been a tremendous time. And uh, I do hope this is uh, going to bless just thousands and thousands of people in one way or another. And, and uh, Godspeed with you, continued uh, success, and just, you know, the spirit of God rest with you and, and give you comfort. I know it's, it's, a, it's been a challenging time, but I've, I've worked with, walked with you a little bit over the last year and kind of seen kind of what's been going on. And so uh, anyway, God will, will definitely preserve you and he will bless your ministry, I know. So anyway. Thank you for bringing credibility to such a difficult topic. Oh, I absolutely. I, I think that's my thing. calling on this one. You know, yeah, so. yeah, so good. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time and bless you. God bless you. All right, everyone, shows in the future. I got lots of things lined up uh, on lots of issues. We're even going to talk about Russia and nuclear war and all those kinds of things sometimes. So, all right, uh, God bless you all. Uh, take care. Bye-bye.